Hey guys, Libby News here, and to celebrate the recent release of Persona 5 Royal, I'm going to be analyzing the themes of Persona 5 and how the game chose to further enforce these themes through the use of Jungian psychology and social commentary. And yes, this will be an analysis video based on the original Persona 5. It won't have any spoilers for Royal, so you can breathe a sigh of relief <laughs> if you haven't finished it yet. Anyways, I don't think the additional stuff added in Royal will affect these aspects I'm going to be discussing since they're pretty broad, so I figured it'd be okay to go ahead and make this video, but if there are some new things in Royal that end up changing things, I'll uh, definitely consider making a sequel for this video. And of course, if you guys like this video as well, that'll also be something that um, will influence me to make a sequel if I need to. And I'm sure it goes without saying, but this video will have spoilers for the entirety of Persona 5, so go ahead and exit now if you don't want to see them. And like I said, no spoilers for Royal. I'm also going to be talking about the darker themes of Persona 5 and some real life events that I believe were the inspiration for some of those darker themes. So if you think it might be bad for your mental health to hear about that kind of stuff, then you may not want to watch this video either. But as for the rest of you guys, let's go ahead and get into this. So just as a small recap, the story is about a group of teenage outcasts rising up against the injustice shown to them within a distorted society. All the main characters, including the boy you play as, sometimes called Rin, sometimes called Akira, has suffered at the hands of a corrupted adult. The overarching idea shown in the games is that everyone, especially young people, are meant to stay shackled by society's expectations of them. They're meant to blindly follow individuals with higher status than them and are forced to compromise their happiness and morality in order to do so. The Phantom Thieves all individually confront the adults they feared so much and break through the hypothetical change that once held them back. Their goal is to conform society by weeding out the distorted adults who abuse the system and change their hearts using the metaverse, a supernatural realm born from humanity's subconscious desires. So like I said before, it uses these themes and real life inspirations in order to better reinforce the themes of the game, but what are the themes? I'm sure it could be said using like a hundred different words, but the ones I would like to use are individualism and rebellion. These themes are portrayed throughout the game repeatedly through various different ways. Listening to the absolute bangers that have come out of this game, you'll notice that the lyrics to almost every song take inspiration from these themes. The primary color used throughout the game is red too, with the same color as fire or blood and is often used to represent passion. They likely used it in this game to represent the fire in the Phantom Thieves' hearts and the passion they feel towards changing society. It also symbolizes the very real danger they must face going against these powerful adults and how they're willing to spill their own blood to do so. Even the Velvet Room in this game symbolizes rebellion, as we see the protagonist trapped inside a cell for a vast majority of the game, only to finally break free from those shackles near the climax. This whole area too foreshadows how he was trapped inside a rigged game created by someone of a higher power, just like what we see in the cognitive world, but just like there, he's able to break free because of that rebellious spirit. But like I said before, it's also incorporated into the game through the use of Jungian psychology. The game takes inspiration from these psychological theories when creating the villains, settings, and the hero's powers in the metaverse. Jungian psychology was created by Carl Jung, and there's many, many aspects of the study that are present in Persona 5, and we'll talk about all of them when we get there, but the first one I wanna talk about is the most obvious one, and that is the idea of the persona. By Jung's definition, it's the hypothetical mask that someone puts on in order to better fit into any situation. It's described by the game in a similar fashion, the god of control posing as Igor, stating that personas are, in other words, a mask, an armor of the heart when confronting worldly matters. The game takes a bit of creative liberty when using the concept of Jung's persona, but overall demonstrates the main concept pretty well in my opinion. For each character in Persona 5, they are forced to confront the identity that society has labeled them as when gaining their persona. A mask forms on their face, representing the less genuine identity identity they put on and show out to the world in order to conform to their society. In this scene, their eyes turn yellow, matching the shadow villains that they face, indicating their inner self is coming to the surface. As well, you can hear their persona talking to them from the inside, symbolizing that they are the true version of themselves that's been hiding all along. Sort of like how you can hear your true self through thoughts while still holding up a facade. In order for this part of themselves to be released, they must rip off the mask that symbolizes their forced identity and embrace their true selves. It appears that it's a pretty painful process as well, with a substantial amount of blood coming out of their face. I think this could symbolize two different things. Firstly, I think the implied pain is to symbolize how difficult it is to come to terms with your true identity, but I think it could also represent that even though your mask is a less genuine part of yourself that you put out to the world, it's still a part of who you are, so the skin and blood that comes off along with it could symbolize removing that small portion of yourself. So as you can see, these scenes are still a similar thought process to Young in terms of the persona as a mask. Regarding the idea of the summonable persona though, the game does take some creative liberty. In the game, their persona is their true self that they can use as an armor after ripping off their mask. So even though the summonable personas in Persona 
Persona 5, by definition, are basically the opposite of Young's idea of the Persona. They do still try to incorporate it by presenting it as something that you can use to face worldly matters like Young would describe it. Each Awakening scene as well focuses on the individual's unique struggles and the power from within they use in order to rise against them. The mask they wear in order to fit in with the society was created by being oppressed by those higher than them and even compromising their own morals or personality for what the oppressor would refer to as the quote unquote greater good. Like for example, how Makoto needed to work with the obviously suspicious Kobayakawa in order to satisfy her sister's high expectations, or Haru who was going to be forced to marry someone she hated for the greater good of her corrupted father's company. It's very anti-individualistic, so seeing them embrace their true selves by ripping off that mask and using it as a weapon to rebel against those who have caused them so much grief is a pretty powerful way to reinforce these themes of individualism and rebellion in my opinion. I do want to mention Futaba here because she is a break in the pattern since she's both a palace ruler and someone who confronts her shadow and becomes a phantom thief. Unlike the others, she doesn't rip off a mask, likely because she doesn't have a mask that she wears to fit in with society since she stays locked in her room. Instead, she has to confront her her repressed memories and distorted cognition of them. In this example, we see that Futaba runs away from her memories because they're too difficult to face. And in her palace, we see that her shadow knows the truth and pushes her to reevaluate these memories and remember what really happened. Even though she doesn't wear a mask like the others, she still was falsely cast as a murderer by corrupted adults. So just like the other Phantom Thieves, she needed to confront the false identity that society pushed on her and rebel against it. In order to take down these twisted individuals, the main characters utilize the metaverse, in which they defeat their target shadow, aka an entity created from the dark side of oneself, the part that they want to hide from themselves and the world. This exactly parallels Young's concept of the shadow. In Persona 5, everyone has a shadow, but most people's shadows reside in mementos. But if a person's thoughts become extremely distorted, then it manifests into an extravagant palace like the ones we see for our main antagonists. In the game, you're able to change the heart of someone if you're able to destroy their palace. In order to destroy a palace, you must steal the shadow's treasure, the source of their distorted desires. And since the palace is a manifestation of their twisted desires, if it no longer exists, then their desires disappear too. After everything's destroyed, eventually the change sets in and the target's desires vanish. In Jungian psychology, he believes that the three main parts of our psyche are the ego, the personal unconscious, and the collective unconscious. The ego is what we as a person are aware of regarding ourselves. The other two are the information within us that we suppress or don't recognize. They're both very different though, so for now we're going to talk about the personal unconscious, which is represented by the palaces where you fight the corrupted adult's shadow counterpart. We will talk about the collective unconscious way, way farther down the line, where it fits better in the video. So as mentioned before, the personal unconscious is information stored within an individual's mind that they are not consciously aware of. This particular information is created through personal development. So some examples include suppressed or forgotten memories. Since these palaces are literally ruled by the antagonist shadow, the part of themselves that they repress and want to hide from the world, I don't think it's too far of a stretch to make the claim that their palace symbolizes this idea of the personal unconscious. I think it's also important to point out that in Jungian maps of the psyche, the shadow is literally found inside of the personal unconscious. Persona does take a bit of creative liberty here too. In the Persona 5 universe, the only time a palace appears is if one's desires become especially distorted, so it only really represents one part of their personal unconscious. By Young's definition, I feel like the personal unconscious is pretty big. It contains everything from childhood memories to distorted, I guess, desires and stuff like we see in Kamashita's palace. The way I see it is that this one part of this huge area manifests into the palace and only because that one part is just so, so distorted. And that's why we don't see Kamashita's childhood memories and stuff while we're going through the palace. And it's sort of hyper-focused on this one thing that's causing the distortions, which is the treasure. But anyways, to go a bit farther, I'd like to outline Kamashita's relation to Jungian psychology and analyze closely how the game ties these psychological theories to its characters, specifically the villains of Persona 5. In Kamashita's case, we see that he, just like the Phantom Thief, wear a hypothetical mask when around others. In public, he comforts Mishima after specking a volleyball his way, but in private will physically abuse him over the slightest inconveniences. In another scene, when he's turned down by On, he acts as if there's nothing wrong, but shows his true feelings immediately after the interaction ends. Next, there's his ego, the part of his personality that he's aware of, which from looking over the cutscenes doesn't seem like much. He's constantly blaming other characters for the horrible actions he's done. He even goes as far as implying that it's Mishima's fault that the protagonist's criminal record 
record was released, when in truth Kamashita was the one who forced him to do so. Inside the palace, we see a shadow far more open and blunt about his corrupt desires, and the treasure the Phantom Thieves need to steal is defined as the core of these desires. In the metaverse, or the personal unconscious, it's a crown because he unconsciously sees himself as the king of the school, but in the cognitive world, it's his Olympic gold medal. The way that I see it is that in Kamashita's ego, he sees himself as a hero. Disgusting, I know. Here to save the school's reputation with his talent and Olympic pride. He has so many people supporting him with expectations of him to succeed that he thinks he deserves to do whatever he wants, whether that be taking out frustration by physically abusing students Students or sexually harassing one of the students. And basically the way he thinks about it is just like, hey, no one's stopping me. In fact, the students and faculty are helping him cover up this stuff, so that must mean what he's doing isn't so bad after all in his head. His shadow even confirms this, stating, the people around me were the ones who kept it secret, adults who want to share in my accomplishments, students who have the drive to become winners. People are willing to protect me so that we may all profit from it. So I believe that he thinks that because he's helping the students get volleyball scholarships and improving the school's reputation, that these things that he does are justified, that he deserves to have these rewards as he refers to them in order to upkeep the school's reputation. Going back to his personal unconscious, what he's not aware of, this is how we see him in the palace. He's an evil king that treats his students like slaves. His actions are the reasons why they're in so much pain. He's not helping them at all. And all this distorted thinking stems from his Olympic gold medal because that's why the school relies on him and covers up for him. And that's how he's able to justify his actions. But once that source of the distortion is taken away, his palace is destroyed and his shadow is brought to the surface. And that's when he truly has to confront who he is. In the last cutscene with Shadow Kamashita, he even mentions that he's planning on returning to the Kamashita in the cognitive world. And I think this is why he only mentions that he thought of himself as a king in the cognitive world after the change of hearts, he literally didn't realize that he saw it that way until his shadow returned himself in the cognitive world. Looking at Kamashita's character arc, there was one aspect that I found to be interesting when thinking about the overall themes of the game. In the depths of Mentos, we see that he, like the rest of society, was locked inside the prison of regression. And just like the Phantom Thieves, he found his own individualism and broke free from his prison, no longer wanting to have this nihilistic view of life. But just like the other corrupted palace rulers, he became overly indulgent in his own desires, and instead of trying to change the system, he abused it and took advantage of those who were still willing to be controlled. I thought this was a pretty interesting parallel to the Phantom Thieves journey, and is likely why they almost sympathize with him and the other palace rulers after learning this truth in Mementos, to the point that they even question their own morality. For now, I'd like to talk about why these themes of rebellion and individualism are so important to portray in this game. The target audience is young people in Japan. Hashino, the director of the game, even mentioned that he was surprised by how well it was received in the West because it's so unapologetically Japanese. According to Hofstede Insights, Japan scores 46 on individualism, whereas the United States scores at 91. This means that Japan is a collectivist society where more focus is put on group harmony rather than individual ideas. So for example, if a company was trying to incentivize their employees to work harder, in Japan, it's more likely that there would be a group reward if they hit their goal. But in the US, it's more likely that the company would make it a competition and only award the person who gets the most done. I do want to clarify and say that it's not really a bad thing per se to be one or the other. They both have their benefits and fallbacks, just like anything else in life. But Persona 5 definitely focuses on criticizing the fallbacks that you might experience in this type of environment. Because there's so much emphasis on group success, many times there's not as much focus on individual opinions and emotions. And we see this represented in the game where many people are willing to just go with the group in order to not disturb the perceived group success, even if it is the morally right thing to do or the better thing for them to do personally personally. The Phantom Thieves even fall victim to this group mentality before unlocking their personas. And unfortunately, there are some real life examples of this in present day Japan that I believe the creators could have been inspired by. And I think this is why these themes are so important to portray. According to an article by The Economist, schools are organized in a way that adds pressure on their students to conform. Since usually they have specific guidelines they have to follow regarding their uniforms, hairstyles, etc. So if a student decides to stand out in any way, not only are they singled out by the staff, but are also likely to be shunned by the rest of the class. We even see this referenced in Persona 5 with both An and Ryuji standing out due to their hair and uniform modifications. Kawakami even nags Ryuji for bleaching his hair, and we see An being outcast by other girls in their class for her looks. 
The article also mentions that there aren't necessarily any more cases of bullying in Japan compared to the rest of the world, but that it's much more severe when it happens there because it's a group phenomenon. One example the article uses was a case in 1986 when a boy killed himself after classmates, encouraged by their teacher, topped months of mental torture with a mock funeral. We see this group bullying mentality heavily referenced in Persona 5 when the protagonist first joins Shujin Academy. Even just casually walking around campus, you see that everyone, and I mean absolutely everyone, is God gossiping about him. Even Kawakami, who's a good-hearted person, is regretting having him in her class and just wishes he would drop out. No one, whether it be the staff or the student body, cares about the circumstances around his case. The only thing they focus on is the fact that he's classified as a delinquent. The same scenario is shown through Ryuji. Kawakami even mentioning that he was a good student when he was a part of track and field, but once he stepped out of line, he was labeled as a troublemaker. Once again, we see this group mentality come into play, where if the group feels that there's a rotten apple that's bringing them down, they will be outcast accordingly. The fact that the staff participates as well in the alienation is incredibly concerning, especially the principal and Kamashita. Unfortunately, Kamashita's character could be potentially inspired by some true events that have happened at Japanese schools. One specific example that sounds too familiar after playing through the first game is one in 2012 where a 17-year-old high school student committed suicide. He was a leader of the basketball club and it's heavily speculated that the reason he took his own life is a result of the physical abuse he suffered from the coach, Hajime Kimura. Kimura had apparently beaten him around a dozen times as punishment for mistakes he made during training practices. Kimura even admitted to the abuse, but the city of Osaka tried to argue that it had nothing to do with the boy taking his own life. He was eventually found guilty of assault and received a short sentence of one year in prison and three years suspension. The punishment is obviously an underreaction, but at the very least, the Board of Education did dismiss him because of the abuse. In a different case, a teacher in Sasebo was found guilty of physically and mentally abusing their students, but only received one month of docked pay as penalty. This is definitely what Persona 5 is hypercritical of during the first palace. A vast majority of the faculty is willing to cover up for Kamashita and dismiss the atrocities he commits in order to not taint the school's reputation. He even uses this idea as one of the main excuses for why he's such an asshole. Others allowed him to take advantage of the school and do awful things because no one was willing to step out of line to stop him. Because of the school's greed and the students' fear of being outcast or punished, everyone just went along with the crowd accepting that this is just the way things are. This foreshadows the idea that the issue of their society is this indifference to try and make a change that we see at the bottom of Mentos. Many people have also speculated that Madarame was inspired by a combination of two different people that pulled similar hoaxes. The first being Mamoru Samaraguchi, a highly acclaimed musical composer who claimed to be deaf. He was hailed as a genius musician and was even referred to as Japan's modern day Beethoven by Time Magazine in 2001. But in 2014, his ghostwriter came out and revealed to the public that he had been ghostwriting for Samaraguchi since the 1990s and that he'd actually been lying about being deaf. The other is Yoshihiko Wada, a famous artist who won an Education, Science, and Technology Minister's Art Encouragement Prize for his paintings, but the award was actually revoked after after stating that his artwork structure was far too similar to Alberto Sugi's, an artist that he knew during his study in Italy. His confession scene too resembles one of a politician who cried relentlessly after being asked if he was misusing public funding. Okamura Foods, as well, was likely inspired by some very real companies in Japan known as black businesses. These are companies that exploit their employees by underpaying them and overworking them. One example is Dentsu Inc., a large advertising company in Japan, which was noted to have pushed some of its employees to work over 100 hours of overtime per month. Unfortunately, due to these companies exploiting their workforce, there have been many cases of employees dying from overworking. This is referred to as kuroshi, and it can be from either suicide or exhaustion. And sadly, it's a term that is common enough to be cited as an official cause of death on a death certificate. One woman who worked at Dentsu who died from heart failure had logged 159 hours of overtime with only two days off the month that she passed away. The Labor Standards Office in Tokyo later attributed her death to Kuroshi. In Persona 5, we see this referenced in Okamura's palace where the workers are seen to break down quite often due to exhaustion. At one point, the Phantom Thieves even come across an incinerator where they find that the bodies of the fallen employees are being turned into fuel used to power the company's production, symbolizing that the company literally runs on the blood of its employees. Okamura even states this bluntly during his boss battle, stating that the true strength of his company is the fact that he can solve any problem by throwing more manpower at it, showing that his concern for his employees' lives is non-existent and he will always put profit above them. This idea is especially vivid since right before he states this, he sends more and more of his employees to the death on his behalf. In a US Gamer article, they note that they are sacrificing themselves for the company in this fight, a literal manifestation of Kuroshi. And I thought that was a really good way to put it. 
In an interview with the director of the project, Ketsar Hishino, he mentioned that originally they had been planning on making the game one where the characters would be backpacking and visiting various places around the world. But while working on that idea and various other concepts, the Great East Japan earthquake happened in Tohoku in 2001 and it made him change his feelings towards Japan, which in turn made him want to create a game that focuses on Japanese culture. There were several controversies that arose from this tragedy, and I think that is what likely pushed him to want to make a game that tackled these issues. After the earthquake hit about 80 miles off the coast of the city of Sendai, it resulted in several tsunamis, one which incited a nuclear meltdown at Fukushima. The Tokyo Electric Power Company was quiet regarding the severity of the nuclear meltdown in order to not spike the public's anxiety more than it already was from the initial disaster. It took two months for them to reveal just how bad the situation was, and many people were completely outraged by the secrecy. One of the movements that it led to was a group started by young people that was specifically prominent on Twitter, and this was a group that just opposed nuclear energy in general, and they went by the name of Twit No Nukes. There was a lot of opposition against how the government handled the situation too. Labor union activists mentioned that the public was very unhappy with the fact that the government wanted to restart the nuclear reactors too soon after the accident, and that this led to protests on the street for the first time in generations. But soon after it stopped being publicized about, the population's interest just kind of moved on and Twit No Nukes fizzled out as well. Another controversial movement in Japan was SEALDS, and it was the only large-scale student movement to emerge since the student protests in Japan in the 1960s. And similarly to the previous movement, it disbanded as well just after one year. And as I mentioned before, there's some foreshadowing throughout the series about the root of society's distortion, this being humanity's indolence. I think that this root issue was likely inspired by the real-life events I mentioned regarding the Tohoku tragedy, and this idea of humanity's shared indolence is given physical form through mementos. And mementos has double symbolism as well, as it also symbolizes Jung's idea of the collective unconscious that I mentioned towards the beginning of the video. In Jungian psychology, the collective unconscious is Jung's theory that within the very bottom of our psyche, there exists information that everyone shares evolutionarily. He believes that when we're born, we're not simply a blank slate, but that within us, we unconsciously hold the instincts and beliefs of those before us, and that this is common information for everyone across existence. In Persona 5, we see a similar idea with everyone in Tokyo having that same indifference towards trying to make a change. And although it's not the same idea as the collective unconscious that Young theorized about, it still mirrors a few of his concepts. Throughout the story, the Phantom Thieves are trying to reform society through changing people they deem as evil. This, on the conscious level, is what they felt they needed to do in order to fix their corrupt society. But in reality, nothing changed, even after fixing what they believed to be the root of the issue, which was Shido. Then once they go into Mementos, they learn that the true issue issue was something they weren't actually conscious of, this being the indifference of everyone to simply just allow themselves to be oppressed. They weren't aware of this even though before unlocking their personas, it was something they originally participated in. It took them ripping off these masks and embracing their true selves as well as digging deeper and deeper into Mementos, aka the collective unconscious, to find what truly was distorting their world. And similarly to Mementos, the collective unconscious is supposed to be the most buried part of your psyche, so having to go all the way down to the bottom to find this shared indolence parallels that idea really well. In Yangin psychology, one has to face all aspects of themselves, including the collective unconscious, in order to achieve individuation. When you reach this goal, Jung believes that one becomes what they were always destined to become from the beginning. I feel like Persona 5 parallels this idea because the Phantom Thieves, like mentioned before, face the issues they are both conscious and not conscious of, and once they did, humanity, which had become distorted with an abundance of laziness and nihilism, could now become what they were truly destined to be, people who have dreams and hope again, just like how Morgana viewed them. The god of control believed that humanity's downfall was their lack of passion. He harped on this a lot, thinking that the world was just too far gone to ever be reformed. He put the protagonist in a hopeless game just to prove his point. If nobody stands up and fights for what's right, then the world is just doomed falling slowly but surely into the depths of hell without even knowing it. This idea symbolized when mementos and the cognitive world fuse, the world literally looking like hell around them, but people don't even realize it. The only way to fix the world is for us to want to fix it, and I think that's the main objective the game wanted to portray in the climax. The world was the one with the ability to create or destroy the god of control. All they needed to do is realize that. I think this ending reminds us that even though it doesn't feel like it, we do all have the power individually to make a change. We just have to have the courage to rebel, one could say. But with all that being said, I do have a bonus section for you guys. I want to talk about the archetypes and the tarot cards used in Persona and what those symbolize and how that kind of relates to the overall theme of the game as well. It doesn't fit as well as like <laughs> the rest of the stuff, you know, in terms of like how I kind of structured it. 
so it's just gonna be a bonus section. Basically, Jung believed that archetypes are found within our collective unconscious, and a big reason why he believed the collective unconscious exists is because of repeated images and roles throughout history, myths, literature, etc. He believes that the reason these things kept appearing throughout existence is because of these archetypes stored in our collective unconscious. There are a lot of archetypes, and I'm sure just looking at them, you'll notice roles you've seen in various works of fiction, besides Persona even, like the hero or the magician. Basically, Jung believed that these archetypes stored in your collective unconscious present themselves to the conscious when the right situation or times come up. And that's why there is all these repeated symbols and roles throughout existence, even when these people who made them lived in very different times, places, etc. with no access to each other. Tarot cards were likely created around the 14th or 15th century, and they are not excluded when it comes to including these archetypical roles. In a 1933 lecture, Young even discusses his opinions on tarot, mentioning that they contain psychological images, symbols, with which one plays as the unconscious seems to play with its contents. So he definitely thought that these were pretty related to his psychological theories. Some examples of archetypes presented in these cards are the mother archetype being seen in the qualities of the empress card, while the hermit embodies the wise old man archetype. And as I'm sure many of you are aware of, the major arcana of the tarot cards are what the confidant relationship titles are based on. Even our protagonist is referred to as the trickster, which doubles as a Jungian archetype and a tarot card. The trickster is a character known to break the rules of God or nature, sometimes maliciously, but usually with ultimately positive effects. Often the rule breaking takes form of tricks or thievery. Tricksters can be cunning or foolish or both. I think this description fits him really well since we're basically going against all the laws of nature in order to change people's hearts forcefully. And although it does have positive results, it's hard not to question whether or not it's right to play God in this way. Even the characters themselves question the morality of their actions during the game. And getting back to the major arcana, generally if those cards are drawn during a tarot card reading, it means that you should focus on the overall direction of your life, whereas minor arcana cards are meant to help you focus on everyday decisions. There's 22 major arcana cards and 21 confidence in Persona 5. You start out gaining the full arcana with the god of control disguised as Igor, not because of him being a dummy, but because it symbolizes the fool's journey. Its number is zero, symbolizing how the fool is an empty vessel lacking life experiences and is unaware of the magnitude of life's challenges and the strength and potential he holds. If you draw this card, you're encouraged to embrace the new journey that lies ahead of you without fear. The Fool is also a Jungian archetype with similar qualities, but it focuses a bit more on the Fool being overly indulgent. The trend continues as you meet more and more confidants, all reminiscent of the major arcana associated with them, Morgana being the magician, another one that doubles as a Jungian archetype. In Jungian psychology, it's related to one whose goal is to transform others or themselves. In fiction, they're the character that guides the protagonist on his journey where that transformation takes place. In tarot, it's a reminder that you are a unique being and have many gifts that others do not hold. These skills set you apart from the crowd and can help you begin new projects or overcome adversity. When the magician comes up in your tarot reading, it's a reminder that you needn't wait. You already hold everything you need to move forward and accomplish what you've set out to do. As you can see, both interpretations fit Morgana's character incredibly well in my opinion, as he was the one to teach Joker how to use his persona before fully embarking on his journey to change the world. But not only that, he was literally made by Igor in order to guide him and make sure he stays on the right path. And he doesn't just want to assist in transforming others though, as one of his main personal goals is to change from a cat to a human. And relating to the tarot definition, he consistently reminds the protagonist of how special he is, mesmerized by the fact that he can use multiple personas. And like I said, this works similarly for all the major arcanas, all relating the tarot and Jungian definitions to the characters that we interact with. Like I mentioned before, there's 22 major arcana cards and only 21 confidants in Persona 5. And that's because the last arcana card is the world and you receive it from Lavinza after completing your journey. In tarot, it represents completion, success, and fulfillment. It shows that you are exactly where you are meant to be on your path. It works as the opposite of the Fool card, symbolizing that you now have a greater understanding of who you are after all you've been through, and that you're ready for the next phase of your journey. I also found a really interesting interpretation regarding this written by Paul Walker Emig on a Kotaku article, basically stating that Joker, being a silent protagonist and who is also representative of the Empty Fool and Tarot, is the character the player is meant to project themselves onto. This serves as the ego, which builds relationships with all these characters that represent archetypes. And through these relationships, it allows you to gain extra skills or add new elements that make your team more complete. He argued that this parallels the Jungian idea of individual 
situation that I mentioned before, where Young believes that one is truly only able to be complete by becoming aware of every aspect of oneself. This includes the archetypes located in the collective and conscious that you'd need to acknowledge and understand. So just like in Jungian psychology, you have to understand and get to know all these archetypes in order to become whole. And in Persona, it's represented by how you can become whole in the battle sense by maxing out everyone and being able to use your full range of abilities during conflict. Honestly, I feel like you can argue a lot of different individuation parallels for some of the other aspects of the game too, but I'm gonna go ahead and end this video here because it's already just like super long. <laughs> I've been working on it for a while. And there's just like even more things I can get into besides that, like the mythology inspiration for like the shadows and things like that. So I'm just gonna stop while I'm ahead. And if you guys want a sequel to this video, just let me know. I feel like if I keep making this video bigger and bigger, it's gonna take longer and longer. And then it's like, well, I should probably just include aspects of Royal. I kind of expected to get this video out a lot sooner. My original plan was to get it up like the weekend Royal went out, but like obviously that didn't work out. I had like some technical difficulties and I really, really underestimated how long this video would take. I tried to put more like love and care into this video than I have in some of my previous videos too. And I hope that shows. I wanted to like really focus on just making a video that I, you know, personally really just enjoy and kind of like take off the pressure I would put on myself for some of my other videos with the character analysis videos like I talked about before because a lot of those videos I would just get like so caught up in thinking like of what everybody else was going to think of it that I got to the point where I wouldn't even really focus that much on like whether or not I liked it so I tried to take a different approach with this video and hopefully it shows and hopefully it's a good thing but yeah I'm sure a lot of you guys are wondering if I've played Royal and I have not yet mostly because I've been so busy with this video but I also started playing Persona 4 Golden kind of recently as well. I'm around like the fourth dungeon still right now and I'm honestly like really invested into it. So I think I'm probably gonna focus on completing that first. One of the main reasons why I started it too is because a lot of people said I should play that before I make an analysis on Akechi since there's just like a lot of spoilers for that game whenever you research him. So that was a big reason why I wanted to go ahead and start it. But yeah, I really, really love it so far. So I just decided to play Persona 4 in my free time because um, since I'm not doing this full time anymore, it just made more sense because the Persona series is very difficult to edit um, for Let's Plays. And for streaming, um, I know a lot of people do it, but I guess I just don't really know how well it would do just because it's a lot of grinding. <laughs> I don't know if like uh, people would be, I guess there would just be like some streams where everybody's like piecing out because they're like, okay, we've watched her fight, you know, like the 15th shadow in a row. Like I think I'm gonna, <laughs> I think I'm gonna peace out for a little bit. You know what I mean? <laughs> I feel like there's a lot of other stuff I want to say like regarding the channel and stuff too. And I was originally thinking of just like tacking it on at the end of this video, but I feel like there's just like too much stuff to talk about. So I think I might just make like an up video, you know, like regarding the channel and like the direction I want to take. So keep a lookout for that. I'm thinking about live streaming soon as well. So if you guys are interested in hearing more updates about that, um, please check out my Twitter. Um, I'll also probably post stuff on um, the community tab as well. I plan on streaming on Twitch rather than on my YouTube channel. But anyways, I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Please leave a like or a comment if you did and please share it if you liked it. I worked really hard on it. <laughs> Hopefully that shows. But yeah, thanks again for watching and I will see you guys real soon.